My name is Yossi Sheffi. I'm, the, uh, I'm a professor at the Engineering System Division and director of the uh, MIT Center for Transportation Logistics. And the idea is to talk today about the impact of the uh, Japanese earthquake and tsunami on supply chain disruption and on logistics activities in general. So what we're going to talk today is about, for the three people in the audience or a little more who don't know what supply chain management is, which says a little, uh, a little premier. We talk about the Japan disaster in several aspects of it. Then we'll talk about a very important aspect of uh, logistics in cases like this, which is the humanitarian logistics. And this part of the talk will be given by Gerald Gonsel, who is a colleague of mine who is working and his research is in this area. So first of all, what is supply chain management? So supply chain management is the, basically the process of ensuring that everybody gets what they want, when they want it, uh, at the lowest possible cost. So everything that you get in a supermarket on the shelf that uh, you know, factories get in, that's the process of managing the supply chain. So it's basically, it's where demand meets supply in some sense. And you all went through uh, you know, econ uh, economics 101 and you see graphs like this. This is not what we're talking about because this is for industry or the whole economy. Here we're talking about what a company has to do in order to meet the needs of its customers. So there are two fundamental challenges in supply chain management and one kind of difficulty. And I kind of go very quickly through this. So the first challenge is to do it at a, you know, minimize the cost. This is some optimization problem, obviously. You want to minimize cost globally. But it's a very hard problem. It's a very hard problem because of, as you'll see in a minute, the size of this problem. There are millions of moving parts, so to speak, in this problem. This not, nothing is well behaved mathematically in this program. There are nonlinear constraints. And then once you did it, the question is you actually have to implement it. This actually has to be implemented in the real world and execution, implementation of uh, uh, the result of, of some optimization is actually not a trivial job. Then there's a, the other, of course, difficulty. The other challenge is nothing is certain. You don't know, and I don't know about you, but when I go to the supermarket to buy milk, I don't call them a week ahead of time and I say, I'm going to go to the supermarket to buy a quart of milk. Instead, they have to guess when I'm going to come. So there's a whole issue of um, forecasting what the demand is going to be. It's also, for, of course, subject to large errors. And the same thing about supply, you know, supply of everything is also not certain. There are the issue of yields and lead times are variables and there's a quality variability. Then there's the difficulty is in the fact that there are conflicting goals. What do I mean by conflicting goals? They are both within a company. If you talk about supply chain, is one company supplying another company, supplying another company. Even within a company, if you look at, uh, if you are the head of manufacturing, you want to run long production runs. It's very efficient. You minimize the cost of manufacturing. But if you are in sales, or you have to supply uh, the customers, well, the customer want one red one in LA and one blue one in Chicago, and you want to make them just on time so you don't keep any inventory, because inventory costs money. So you want to put each one, whatever one is, in a little FedEx envelope and send it to the customer. Well, that's, of course, transportation is very expensive. So either you, you do long production runs, which means you have to keep a lot of inventory until you get rid of a lot of the stuff, and this is expensive, or transportation is expensive. So be, and this is, this is one example. There are all kinds of uh, issues to balance like this. And then, of course, many companies involved, and each company has its own objectives in some sense, and uh, one has to adjudicate between all of them. So... To give you an idea of how supply chain works, let's talk about a very simple problem of building a toy car, a toy automobile. So to build this, it has a few parts. And uh, we start with some, uh, you know, shaping wood and uh, working on the uh, uh, painting it and putting some uh, uh, windshield around it. That's kind of one process. And then there are two other processes going at the same time. We have you know, we work on the tires and the wheels here, and we work on the axles here, and then we put them together, and then we kind of bring the body 
and the undercarriage together to, uh, to assemble them in some, uh, uh, in some other place. We actually at this point have a toy car, we inspect it, and this is the toy car. This process of exploding all the requirements backwards is a material requirement planning process, the jargon, the, you know, the name for it. And one of the difficulties here is that there are several companies involved. So if you look just at this uh, branch of the tree, there's the original equipment manufacturer who actually assembles the car. There's an assembler who may be s assembling the wheel set. There's a tire manufacturer who makes the tire. These are kind of different companies. Furthermore, those companies are fed by yet other companies. So for example, there's a, you know, somebody produces rubber, somebody produces paint who go there, and those companies are fed by a whole lot of others. It kind of goes backwards and backwards. Same thing on this side, of course. And of course, so we have a kind of, you know, Russian doll that's stuff within a stuff within a stuff, only it's a multi-dimensional, in millions of dimensions of, of, of dolls. Kind of a little more complicated than your standard Russian doll. So, and this is with a toy car, of course, when we look at the actual car, they look a little different. So we have uh, quite a few more parts. And in this case, we just look at actually sub-assembly, not even all the parts. A car would have about between 40 and 50,000 parts. Uh, depending how you count, if you go down to the screw level, you get over 100,000 parts. And this is what uh, GM, for example, looks at in GM supply chain. It has about 3,000 what you call tier one supplier. This is the supplier that GM sees. It buys directly from them. And of course, those suppliers have their suppliers and their suppliers, so to speak. They have about 200 manufacturing locations. They have about uh, 160,000 parts, part numbers. They make 9 million uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, and they spend a lot in logistics. And of course, $100 billion in purchasing material from, this, from uh, these suppliers. For example, this is, uh, these are some of the suppliers of the uh, 2010 Corvette. Uh, it's kind of hard to read, but all these comp none of these companies are GM. They are all different companies that make all kinds of parts, and these are just some. It's a small sample of the companies that contribute parts to the Corvette. So, in addition to the complexity of uncertainty, the, there's always some large-scale disruption coming sometimes, of course. And here we're talking about the Japan disaster and the supply chain impact of, uh, uh, of the Japan disaster. So, we talked about this Russian doll and some examples. So a company called NTK make what is called lambda sensor. It goes into the exhaust and actually measure the oxygen in the car to measure the, uh, the efficiency of the, uh, of the exhaust gas. But NTK is out of business because of the, uh, uh, of the, tsunami, of the earthquake and tsunami. So it cannot make engines because of this and Citroen Peugeot cannot make any diesel car. This goes to diesel engines. So as we speak, Peugeot Citroen, which is a, of course, a large French automobile company, combination of Peugeot and Citroen, cannot make diesel engines. And diesel engines, as those of you who drive in Europe know, are 60 to 70 percent of the cars in Europe. This is a sensor that goes into an airflow unit made by Hitachi. The sensor, this little thing is a $2 part that goes into a $90 part, and this Hitachi plant has been hit. This goes into the manifold here of an automobile, and the truck engine plant in New York is out of parts. It's actually shut down. It does not work. And the GM Holton Manufacturing in Shreveport, uh, Shreveport Louisiana, of the, this is the 2011 Colorado so-called uh, truck, there are 1,100 people out of job in Louisiana. They also closed the plant in Spain, in Zaragoza, Spain, the largest open plant uh, in the world, and they closed plant in Germany and UK, which are not working because this part cannot be made. So we will come later to a question, does it make sense to have a large company depending on what part made somewhere in the world? And it's only one company that can make it or one company that can make, you know, 70, 80 percent of it. For example, in the case of the Lambda sensor, there's another company that's making it. It's, it's Bosch in Germany. Bosch in Germany, 
And NTK makes it about 60% of the world supply. Bosch makes it about 40%, approximately. So one would ask, why wouldn't Peugeot call Bosch and ask, why did you send us some of these parts? Well, Bosch has long-term relationship with Volkswagen, with BMW, with Mercedes. Bosch is a German company, supply German manufacturer. So just assume, just assume that you are a Bosch manager and you get a call from the French, from Peugeot, say, why don't you start directing some of the supply to us? And you say, hmm, okay, what should I do? Should I work with my long-term 50 years relationship that I have with these German companies or shall I, you know, dent them and hamper their, their manufacturing and send stuff to France across the border? Well, in most cases, you would not. You would not um, risk long-term relationship for doing something like this. So even though NTK is not the only supplier in the world, they're basically the only supplier to Peugeot Citroën. This is a marketing view of the 787, a new airplane. This is the supply chain view of the 787. This is where lots of the part, the 787, uh, Boeing, in order to reduce the risk, decided to get suppliers to pony up and participate in the design and manufacturing of the 787. So these are the parts that are made in Japan. Now, it's not a big deal because the, part of the plant, the main plant is in Nagoya, which was not hit, basically. Nagoya is south, south uh, west of, uh, uh, of Tokyo. It was not hit. However, they don't ev Boeing doesn't even know where are the suppliers of this, of Mitsubishi, basically, who is the, uh, you know, the manufacturer of all these large parts, large sections of the 787. They have thousands of suppliers all over Japan. Many of them were hit. At this point, Boeing cannot even look into the third and fourth tier into the Russian doll to see what's going on. So they just wait for stuff to hit them at this point. Close to home, a product that we all, some of us know and love, not all, uh, the iPad. This is the marketing view of the iPad. This is uh, how people like us look at the iPad. Uh, all kind of parts. And if you look at the, it is five major parts that are made in Japan. The two last ones are made by a single supplier who was hit. So the, uh, the overlay glass is made by Asahi glass that has uh, two plant damage and one with, which has serious problems. So it's not clear that the glass, there's very special glass that are the top of the uh, iPad 2. Can be, can be manufactured, certainly not, uh, not in the near term. And th there's also a problem with the batteries made by uh, uh, Korea, which is uh, in Awaki. Awaki plant has been shut down since the earthquake because it's only 37 miles from Fukushima. This is, where the, this is where all the news are. This is where the nuclear plants are. This is where the, the uh, Awaki plant is. And this is a picture of the, this is actually the plant. And the issue is that when you have a plant like this, in this situation, the main problem is the people. Your workers are not getting up first in the morning, first thing in the morning and worrying about what they're going to do today in the plant. They're worried about where they're going to sleep. They're worrying about their families. They're worrying about they have enough to eat. They have enough gas for the car. They have enough of anything, enough shelter. So you have a problem that with all your workers and their families. And the plant itself turns out was not badly damaged, but it brings the, a lot of imports for what it needs for this uh, uh, PBDF to the port of uh, Onahama. This is what the port looks like. So obviously the port is useless. And again, the issue is, it says we bring it to some other ports. First of all, many ports were damaged. And second, the other ports are, you know, are at capacity anyway or, or close to capacity, very hard to bring more stuff. And then the roads going and the railway line going up north are all damaged. So it's a problem. Finally, there's one more thing about the iPad 2. There's a, a resin, BT resin, that is made by a subsidiary of Mitsubishi Gas Chemical in Japan where they're basically out of, out of business. So 
what happened is these resins go to two companies in Taiwan for uh, they make integ uh, IC substrate, integrated sucrose substrate. And this combined TSMC it makes semiconductor. And both of these companies, I, you know, both of these and TSMC, TSMC is in semiconductor and cases or, you know, Unimicron, one of them that does it, send the integrated substrate to one of these companies, also in Taiwan, ASE or Spill. They make the printed circuit boards. They go into Foxconn in China. Foxconn in China puts together actually the iPad, and then it goes to your favorite. Uh, actually, from that point on, it's not going. It goes to LA Long Beach on a ship, and then it goes to on a train to Dallas, um, da uh, Dallas Fort Worth, from where from and from Dallas Fort Worth distributed to the to the entire United States. But the point is that here we have a fourth tier supplier, somebody four deep into this uh, Russian doll, four deep into the supply chain who may be causing real problem in the manufacture and in the supply of iPads. Uh, but okay, so this is the, some examples of the impact on international supply chains. Let's talk about what's happening in Japan, the rest of Japan outside the impacted area. Because outside the impacted area doesn't mean that they don't have any impact. So first of all, there are continual problems. It's not done. We just had a 7.4 earthquake today. Uh, so there are aftershocks, continuing earthquakes. There's radioactivity. It's still, nobody knows for sure what's going on with the radioactivity out of the damaged plants. There are rolling blackouts throughout Japan that are impacted industry as well as quality of life. And there are huge gas shortages, something we don't hear about a lot, but they're very real. There's just the, the whole supply of gas, of, uh, of gasoline was damaged. So we have a continuing uh, problems that are not, it's not a, like Haiti, just happen and it doesn't happen anymore. These are continuing problems. Um, one example of uh, one of the reasons for shortages in Tokyo, there's a petrochemical uh, complex here right next to Tokyo, but turn out it was hit with the, uh, um, uh, in the earthquake. It makes a, it's plastic vinyl material that's actually used to coat this uh, tray to make sure that the, uh, you, you cannot make the trays just with, a, uh, with cardboard because you don't want the food to seep into it. So they make the trays, and these trays are used in several products. For example, in milk cartons, in water bottles, which, by the way, is a huge, huge demand now in, uh, um, in Japan because it says where the, bottle, where the water is coming from rather than the tap water, which most people in Tokyo don't believe what's, what the government is telling them. And it makes, for those who like it, this is called netto. This is really a um, very important part of Japanese diet made of fish. And to the Western palate, it not, may not be exciting, but it's a delicacy in Japan. Oh, I don't know, delicacy, but they eat it a lot. And they cannot eat, get, because they cannot get the container for both of these, this is now part of the shortage part of the reason for shortage. And you see Bershev supermarket throughout Tokyo, and it's not only this. You have hoarding behavior. People are buying anything, and they're buying it for, the f for several reasons. First of all, they want to make sure that they have it. And second, they don't know if the next supply will be radioactive in the following sense. There's a fear that the next shipment of food, where is it coming from? I mean, was it somehow impacted? So people are hoarding and making the situation, of course, a lot worse. So a lot of the inventory, it's not that it doesn't exist, it moves from the shelves to people's homes. But at this point, other people cannot get to it, of course. So it changes the whole demand pattern and who gets what. So let's we could create, of course, another problem for the companies who try to supply the market. Um, finally, before I turn off to Jared, let me talk about what do we, how do we overcome disruption? How do we plan to overcome disruption? I'll describe some of the things, but this is not the first disruption ever. And if we have time, I'll talk about this is some cases of companies who suffered really big disruptions. Uh, that they, for example, I just mentioned one, uh, just mentioned who they are. Uh, PNG, the Folger plant in uh, uh, New Orleans, was com almost completely destroyed during Katerina. It took them several weeks to, to, to get back to market. 
heroic effort, they, uh, they got it back. Nokia suffered when a supplier in, uh, um, in New Mexico had the fire and got out of business. Turns out that the, this supplier used to supply both Nokia and Ericsson. Ericsson went out of business. Ericsson does not make cell phones anymore. They were both companies that had the same, same market share. And these are not little nothing companies. Ericsson is a, the pride of Sweden. I mean, it's a big, good company. And by not doing some of the right thing, they're out of business. And Nokia did very well. Toyota had a case that, again, I can discover it in a, uh, a little more detail, but Toyota had a case where the uh, proportional valve was going to the brake of every Toyota car. The plant that made, there was one plant that made them. The plant uh, uh, caught fire and was gone. And 145 suppliers from all over uh, Japan came to help um, Toyota to get back, back in business. And they did. The interesting thing, when they did an after, after action report, they decided to stay with one supplier. The single supplier, and we can talk about why later. But in any case, this is just uh, there are many, many uh, you know cases that we can talk about of of, of what happened. But uh, there are all kind of risks, you know, when you talk about supply chain. You know, there are random phenomena like like we do, earthquake, tsunami, floods. Uh, there are accidents. You know, safety is always always a problem. We always have accidents in. Nuclear power plants, in chemical plants, in you know, control towers, in airplanes, what have you. Uh, government and politics can get in the way of supply chain. This is a picture of Tiananmen Square. Uh, this can get in the way, of course, of moving stuff in and out of certain countries. There's an issue of non-compliance when companies uh, don't comply with regulation. The government may come and close them. And this happened the th four years ago. There was the um, lack of... Uh, flu vaccine in the United States because Chiron, a plant, a plant of the company called Chiron in the UK, was closed by the government because they were not complying with certain safety, uh, uh, safety regulations. Then there's competition, you know, stuff can come from, you know, who knows. You know, who would have ever guessed that Apple would take over Sony? Sony controlled the music business with, you know, uh, all the little products, and then came the iPod and just stole the business. And then they came in. So competition can come from, and it can, can be process competition or, pro, or uh, you know, product competition. Then the economy can go sour, which just did, which makes off a problem. Then there's sometimes social, social disconnect when companies doesn't realize that they do something that the society doesn't like. Um, Nike had this issue when there was a picture in Time magazine, on the cover of Time magazine of a boy sewing soccer balls for 12 cents a day. And there was a boycott of Nike because of this. And Nike also thought that they're doing a great thing because these people had no job without it. They were starving. But they were you know, going over a certain line that uh, people didn't, uh, didn't uh, feel comfortable with. There are lots of examples like this that people have to stay with the program, so to speak, with the social mood. Finally, the all kind of, you know, you can think about intentional disruption, things like terrorism attack or even strikes. And, uh, sabotage. The issue is not where the attack is coming from. You can get yourself, you know, if you are trying to plan for it, you can get overwhelmed. But the issue is it actually matters little what the reason for the disruption is. What you have to think about the supply chain manager, what you can have is measurable things. You know, a supplier can be out, a transportation leak is down, demand changes suddenly, factor enterprise change. And if, uh, you know, a few. doesn't matter what the reason is. doesn't matter if there's a strike in the plant in Tokyo or the plant was closed because of an earthquake. You don't have the product of this plant. That's the disruption as far as supply chain is concerned. You can think about how to prepare for it. You think about it in this way. Uh, so how do you build resilience? How, resilience is a, is a term taken from material science. It's the ability of uh, for material to retain its former shape after deformation. Here we are talking about the ability of a company, in this case, to get back to the same level of manufacturing, level of service, whatever criteria you have, after being hit with some type of disruption. So one way to do it is to create redundancy, to have more stuff than you need. You have more safety stock, just stock lying around. You are selling cars, you are selling them, you know, have lots of cars are around, a dealer's lot, just in case. Have, uh, you know, extra manufacturing plant, have extra capacity, more than you need. There's one little problem with this. 
you cannot stay in business when you run a company like this. It's very, very expensive to do it, especially when your competitors are not doing this. So they don't have a lot of inventory. Then. And when I say inventory, you, you may think about um, just the cost of carrying inventory, you know, housing it and storing it and you know, chilling it, whatever, guarding it. No, no. When you talk about, for example, high-tech or fashion goods, inventory can go out of style or the technology changes on you and it's suddenly worth nothing. So, or, or worth a lot less. So inventory carrying costs are very, very expensive. Another thing to do is talk about create flexibility and the, the, the flexibility to move to different places. And the, the uh, secret of flexibility is interchangeability, being able to interchange. What do I mean by interchange? Intel, for example, has all its plants are identical. Identical plants. It didn't start as a resilient strategy. Actually, it started from the old days of making chips, which was basically a witch's brew, and engineers didn't figure out why sometimes they get a high yield from a wafer and sometimes a low yield, and the difference between making a lot of money and losing a lot of money. So once they got it right, management said basically, copy this sucker around the world. And that's what they did. They're all identical. Uh, they also, when you're talking about part utilization, Intel, just uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, went, to, went from having 2,000 resistors, basically, in all its projects to only 35, and standardized a lot of them. So each one of them can be used in lots of, uh, uh, lots of resistors. And this, is, this works very well, because on the one hand, it, uh, it works very well. You need to keep, you know, uh, you need very low inventory, because one product sells, one board doesn't sell. The inventory that you keep is, is more or less stable. But it goes against the grain, of course, of engineers. And many of us in the audience are engineers. And engineers get a lot of psychi satisfaction by building a part that is 0.0001% better than the next guy in the next cubicle. This, of course, creates an explosion of many, many parts that's hard to manage. It. Each one is good only for one thing rather than, uh, rather than a lot of things. So it's an issue. Uh, and you want to standardize. However, let me just say that you want to standardize to an extent. There's also risk in standardization. It also has to, has to be a balance. The exa another example I give here that I didn't show here is uh, Southwest Airlines that uses only, uh, only 737. Now, it's a great for some risk. For example, when Boeing um, created the new glass cockpit for the 737, you know, uh, Southwest executive came and said, well, maybe, maybe we'll buy this plane, but you have to go back and change all the a digital cockpit to look like the old steam gauges because we, need, we are disrupted all the time. We need every pilot to go into every, every cockpit and be able to run it because there are you know, weather and you know, lates and all this. The problem is, on the other hand, you get only 737. So there's a, when there's a problem with the 737, suddenly, what happened last week? 79 airplanes were grounded. The entire 737, uh, 300 feet was grounded. So you have, risk always have to be balanced. Uh, talk about product standardization, we talked about before, just give you an example. This is the Mercedes E-Class. It has, you can order it in any one of 3.9 trillion combinations. Now Mercedes doesn't sell 3.9 trillion cars, certainly not the E-Class. Uh, but you can order it in any combination. You can order, you know, um, electric power in the, in the front and cranks in the back, whatever. Whoever wants it, you can, you can order it. Think about it means that there are almost no two Mercedes E-Class on the road that are the same. Think about what it does for maintenance. Think about what it does for rework, for recall. Think about the cost down the line. On the other hand, by comparison, Honda, Honda Accord, which sells 10 times more than the Mercedes E-Class, has only 529 combinations. This includes color, engines, you know, uh, packages, what have you. It means it's a lot easier to maintain, a lot easier to respond to all kind of unexpected disruptions. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. UPS gets a lot of its flexibility from the cross-training of its people. Uh, finally, let me just tell you, the supply chain structure itself can create resilience, so the ability to respond to all kinds of disruption. Talking here about postponement, I'll give you one example. This is a, uh, the example is from Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard makes, uh, uh, makes computers in makes printers in Vancouver and, and Singapore for Europe. And usually what it does, it makes all kind of printers in, in every language. 
and sends them to the, to the appropriate store in the appropriate country. Turns out, invariably, they get stuck with too many Swedish printer and not enough Slovak printer, or the other way around. So they got an idea. So why don't I send everything? And that's what they, that's what they did until uh, very recently. They send the, what they call vanilla computers. They don't have customization into a distribution center in Holland. And once they get an order from a particular country, they actually change the box, and they can, through the box, put in the right power supply, they throw in the core, they throw in the decals, they throw in the user manual in the right language. That's why, by the way, when you buy a HP printer in the US, the decals come on it. If you buy a HP printer in Europe, you have to put in the decals yourself because of this, uh, of this operation. Now, so, and then once they get the order, they finish the, 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 the printer goes to the particular country. Now, why is this a resilient strategy? Because, for example, let's say there's a strike in France. Admittedly, this is not a low probability event. But you get a strike there, you're not stuck with too many French printers, you can go anywhere with this, uh, uh, with this printer. It's an example of how the supply chain structure itself creates resilience. Uh, finally, in terms of responding to disruptions, let me suggest that uh, we, we had a lot of, you know, I, I wrote a book on, uh, on supply chain resilience and we had a long study, a long research project, still continuing. It was clear that uh, we came up with many factors that we are not capturing everything. It was clear that there is something in the DNA of resilient companies that can come back easily that does not exist in the DNA of other companies. And uh, you can call it culture or whatever. But some elements of this are the, first of all, resilient companies communicate obsessively. Uh, some example, Dell, for example, uh, you know, managers have, um, get every two hours production report about what's going on everywhere, uh, everywhere in, in the plant. The counter example is, was, of course, JetBlue the three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, on February 14th, there was an ice storm in New York and it grounded the airline, basically. Uh, airplanes were all over the place. Not only people who tried to call the, uh, uh, the center couldn't get through, the crews couldn't get through. They had 10,000 crews all over the United States. It took them three and a half weeks to get back to normal operation, and the CEO lost his job over this. This is particularly important when you talk about distributed power. It's easy to respond when you give the power to respond to the people close to the action. So people who study supply chain management know about Toyota. Toyota have what they call the and code in the production line. If any um, worker on the production line sees a problem, they can pull the and cord and stop the line. Uh, why is this good? Because they, because they discover a defect immediately and then a whole team of engineers comes in and solves the problem. It's good because if you don't do it, you, have, you discover it later, you have a whole lot of cars that already you have to rework them. And if you don't discover it, there's a whole lot of cars that go to the, uh, to the customers, you have warranty problems, and on top of it, you get reputation for lousy cars. So it's good to do it the first time. What I didn't realize is happening you know, in the Navy. We had several Navy officers with us, and they were saying that on an aircraft carrier, every sailor on the deck has the right and the responsibility to stop flight operations if they see a problem. They'll never be punished, and they'll be celebrated if they're wrong. They'll never be punished if they're, uh, they're, they'll never be published, punished if they're wrong. They'll be celebrated if they're right. But they have the right to stop the operation of about 15 ships, 17,000 sailors and marines, and the reason for being for an aircraft carrier or aircraft carrier task force is flight operation. Uh, finally, let me just mention Zara and World. Uh, some of you may know Zara. Uh, World is a very similar Japanese company that is, uh, what they do is the following. You know, one of the toughest business in the world is a business of supplying fashion for young women mainly because of my daughter. <laughs> because my daughter would buy this particular, you know, yellow blouse during the selling season, during the, the main season, any price. You know, at the end, six or eight weeks after that, she wouldn't clean the floor, with, the floor with it. These people have to guess 18 months ahead of time what my daughter would want to wear. My daughter doesn't know what she's doing for lunch. That's, of course, the challenge. So companies like Zara and World are, World is very similar, it's a vertically, vertically integrated uh, Japanese company, Japanese retailer and, and manufacturer. And in both stores, managers go around the store and check why people return stuff to the, 
to the shelf. They know why people buy. They, they know when people buy because they have the point of sale system. You know, scan it and know what, what people buy. They don't know why people don't buy. So manager go around the store and ask people, did you like, uh, you don't like the lapel, you don't like the color, why? They put it into an information system run every night and once in a while they discover a trend. The trend that immediately fed into design shops that redesigned the stuff, send it to manufacturing and replenish the store. So under storage operation, I was talking to the CEO of World, who's an old, old Japanese gentleman, and we're talking about it. And I tried to explain what I know. I don't speak Japanese, he doesn't speak English, so there was a translator. Explained for a few minutes what I knew about the operation, and then he smiled and explained to me, talked for six, seven minutes, and explained what, uh, what they're doing. And then the, the translator turned back to me and said, empowerment. At that point, I knew we should have had the more expensive translator. But uh, the issue is, that's exactly what he meant. He meant the people can react, the people at the, at the design uh, center, are all young, create, can have the authority. They don't need any process, any contracts, any, uh, any approvals to redesign the stuff, send it to, you know, send raw material to manufacturing, get the manufacturing, replenish the store, it takes them three to four weeks to do it. it takes Marks and Spencer, famous, you know, British chain, about nine months to do the same process. And he said, sometimes they make mistakes. It takes them only three weeks to fix the mistakes. So to give you an idea about Zara, a year ago, Madonna had a concert, had a series of concerts throughout Spain. It was about four weeks. So on the first concert, she looked like this. Three weeks later, when she appeared in Barcelona, all the young girls were dressed like this. It was Zara that got this, uh, this look and sold thousands of these for young women who were going to the, uh, to the concert. Anyway, um, i give an example. Let me just quickly mention the example of uh, what happens in Katerina. Katerina, many parts of the U.S. government failed miserably. Miserably. The, 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 the city of New Orleans, the government of Louisiana, FEMA, miserable failures. And that cost lives. The one organization, part of the Department of Homeland Security, that operated, I mean, unbelievably well was the Coast Guard. For a variety of reasons. But the main reason, if you look at the Coast Guard website, if you look at the tenets of the Coast Guard, it's integrity, patriotism, and local initiative. Local commander do what is needed. They, they basically, you know, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. They just do it. And to me, it was exemplified by the young pilot of a C-130, C as few people know, it was also, if you remember, it was also a huge ecological disaster. There was a lot of oil all over uh, the Mississippi Delta. And this plane was up, as the storm was still raging, trying to take pictures. It had the, you know, big cameras and five camera operators tried to take pictures of what's going on. When the pilot got up, they realized the downstairs, the police, the fire, the Coast Guard, nobody can talk to each other. They didn't have the same communication, but she changed the mission. The, uh, you know, young lieutenant changed the mission, put all the camera operators on the radio, they had five radio, two VHF, two UHF, one uh, uh, SSB. They put them on the radio, and for the first 10 hours, she was the communication between all the parts downstairs. What it takes for a, only people who did not serve in any armed forces may not realize what it takes for a lieutenant just to change the mission on their own when there's no command tracks, it doesn't know who, who to call even. Just do it. So, but to me, it exemplifies the Coast Guard, and the, the power of the Coast Guard. Uh, we talk about the uh, resilient companies, the passion for the work. Again, I don't want to go too much in, uh, into it. Uh, when there's a disruption, you see some, some, something is, is changing. You see in these companies, difference to expertise rather than rank. So if you stand in the Heathrow Tower, Kennedy Tower, on a early Monday morning when it's raining and two Pakistani pilots who don't speak English are in the sky. And it's very tense. There are, you know, hundreds of airplanes around. And suddenly you realize that the people who call the, shock, the shots are not the FAA supervisor, but the veteran controllers. And then nobody blows a whistle. It just happens. And the FAA realizes it. The FAA actually encourages, realizes it. The same thing happens in nuclear power plants, in uh, chemical plants, lots of other places. Anyway, conditioning for disruption. Some companies are just good at it. I, uh, airlines are good at it because they're disrupted all the time. 
So they simply get good at it, at, uh, at responding. Finally, the last thing that uh, I want to say is that we talk about culture. It's uh, very hard to define culture. It's even harder to change culture. But there are some glorious examples of changing culture. For example, the first one I mentioned is safety. You know that uh, 80, 90 years ago, dozens, actually, hundreds of people used to get killed and maimed in railroad yards, in factories throughout the United States. An executive used to write op-eds in the Wall Street Journal saying, well, if we put in safety measures, we're not going to be competitive. Now, can you imagine a CEO today goes on Lou Dobbs tonight and say, well, so we kill a few people every Tuesday, but are we, are we competitive? It's just the culture has changed so much that it's unacceptable. Uh, quality, you know, 40 years ago, Ford managers, when they used to travel around, never told anybody that they're working for Ford. They were afraid that the seatmates would attack them. The quality of the cars was so bad. But they really believe that it costs too much to put quality into the car until, of course, Toyota proved this fallacy, to prove the fact that it actually costs less to build quality cars. Uh, there are many others, smoking, drinking, and driving, and many others. Anyway, so let me stop here and turn over to Gerald to talk about another aspect of logistics in a, uh, inside a disaster, and this is the humanitarian logistics. Thanks, Josie. Um, so Josie has been talking about the impact of the crisis on supply, you know, the suppliers in Japan and providing supply around the world about the areas outside of the affected area. I'm going to focus on the, the needs and the demands of the people and the communities inside the affected area of the, of the disaster. And um, we've been doing some work with organizations over the last seven, eight years, um, various organizations in, in, this, in this space. So I'll talk about some of the things that we see. It's, again, a supply chain challenge. Uh, you've got demand and you've got supply. Uh, although a lot of times when we're talking about a situation where there's a humanitarian context, it, you don't think about demand as much as you do need. You're trying to understand what are the needs of the people. Um, and then there's various actors in coordination, in coordination that has to happen to make sure that those two things are being met. So I'll talk briefly about each of these aspects. In terms of need, this is a list that comes from uh, Medicine Sans Frontier about what, you, what, what are the priorities uh, in, a, in a refugee situation when you have people displaced from their homes for, from, uh, for one reason or another. It could be a natural disaster, it could be a conflict, and they've resettled someplace else. Uh, the first thing you do is you try to assess what's going on so you can start to trigger the supply chain, and I'll talk more about what you do to get that going. Uh, one of the first things you also do is measles immunization because Measles is very highly contagious, spreads quickly, and they found that by um, being very vigilant about Im implementing measles vaccinations right away as in, a, in a resettlement situation, they can reduce the infant um, or the child mortality significantly, sometimes it's, and, and cut it in half um, by preventing that. Then beyond that, the things you would expect, water and sanitation, food, shelter, health care, managing other epidemics that are not, not quite as... Um, uh, don't spread as quickly and, and virulently as measles, the public health situation, uh, human resources, and, and the psychological aspects as well. Um, so this is kind of a list of priorities. Now, some of these may align with kind of your classic basic survival. What can you sur how long can you survive without air? Three minutes. Without warmth? Three hours, which has an impact on shelter if you're in a certain climate. Uh, three days without water, and you can survive three weeks without food. Another way of trying to think of how do you set priorities? Because the challenge you have in managing a supply chain after a crisis or in a humanitarian situation is you will not have enough supply typically or at least the ability to move it in the, in the time you need to, you'll have bottlenecks, so you have to do, make prioritizations and prioritize certain commodities over other things. So um, in Japan now, as, as Josie showed you, some pictures of shelves being empty. Um, obviously, food and water is, is a challenge in a lot of areas. Um, but it's important to remember that in the northern part where the, the earthquake hit, it's very cold. In fact, they had snow, as you see in the picture here. Um, these are some search and rescue workers uh, amidst the rubble of, uh, of shelter that has been destroyed, yet there is snow and there's cold. So in a normal situation, water and food might come ahead of shelter. In the northern part of Japan, because of the conditions and the cold, shelter became a, a more important thing to focus on right away. So depending on the context, the priorities will shift. And the way we think about this in the humanitarian space is there's a hazard that, that comes across. There's a vulnerability of the people to the hazard. And when you look at those together, you can start to understand what are the priorities in the context. Um, 
in addition to just the, and assessing initially what needs to happen, you have to think about what are the follow-on effects in the humanitarian situation. Oh, I should mention, by the way, in addition to the list there in, in Japan, especially now, partly because of the warmth issue, um, fuel and electricity became critical commodities to manage. And as Yossi mentioned, fuel shortages are, are one of the big issues in the northern part of Japan right now, uh, and as well as the rolling blackouts. Again, affecting the ability to provide warmth. So, in addition to the initial uh, situation, you also think about how things are going to transition going forward. So, we're kind of in the emergency shifting to the transitional stage in Japan, and I want to map a few other examples here that you may remember. So, in Katrina, um, and this is about shelter, um, uh, how many of you recognize this first picture? This is the emergency or the evacuation situation. Superdome. So this is, the, this is the end zone. This is the Saints end zone right here. The field's still pretty green. People are just starting to arrive. Probably didn't have any idea what it would, what it would become in the coming days. So that's the first situation is finding emergency shelter. Some place to go to get away from the elements, have some basic shelter. You want to move people quickly into some kind of a transitional, transitional situation. How many of you can recognize what this is? FEMA trailers, those were also very well documented in terms of uh, the amount of FEMA trailers being provided. So you can you have a bit bigger suitcase than maybe you carried here, moving into the FEMA trailer. And eventually you may transition to something more permanent. You get a nice uh, blue duplex here to move into uh, at the end of the, the journey. So that movement from emergency to transition to permanent shelter is, is something you have to think about throughout the whole process. In Haiti, uh, similar kind of uh, transitions, but very different con context. So the emergency shelter, there are no superdomes in, in Port-au-Prince for me, people to go to. So they went to open fields, uh, golf courses, uh, any place where there's open space and put up whatever shelter they could, they could bring and find themselves. So, um, and, and quickly what you want to try to do in that situation is provide a better quality of shelter in that, in that context. And especially in Haiti, because the rainy season was coming, a big priority early on was to provide tarpaulins and, and waterproof uh, 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 materials, and especially tents that are more durable, so that in people that move to these displacement camps would have better shelter in anticipation of the rainy season. Then you want to move to a transitional shelter. This is uh, from the uh, Catholic Relief Services website, uh, of a, an example of a, a wood structure with a tin roof. Again, meant to be temporary, not, not a permanent structure, meant to, get to, to move people away from something that's not as as hygienic. You know, there's a lot of issues with, with water running through the, 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 a camp like this and, and sanitation concerns and so forth. If you move people into something like this, a structure like this, it's a lot safer, but it's not meant to be permanent. The permanent solution in Haiti is still uh, an ongoing challenge. Even a year later, um, they have, a lot of the workers have gone around and done this spray painting of various, facility, of various buildings to classify them as red being that you cannot have it, inhabit, the building has to be rebuilt. Yellow needs to be, it means it needs to be repaired, and green means that you can inhabit it. So they've started classifying things, but the process of rebuilding is going to be long, and, um, uh, and, and so that this transition may take a lot longer uh, in terms of the supplies and the capabilities that are needed to, to provide that permanent housing. In Japan, um, initially, people, a lot of the, the people in those northern provinces that were affected went to places like schools and, and gymnasiums and so forth um, for the evacuation shelter. And then they, they have, they have, the government has now started building temporary shelters um, in, in those regions. One of the issues they've had is that at that particular, the geography of that part of the country is that there's, it's very hilly, very mountainous, a lot of trees, so it's difficult to procure flat open spaces for the transition shelters. So they've got a plan for, actually it's now over 30,000 I've seen in the latest report, they're planning to build, um, but only 8% of the land has been secured to build them. So it's a matter of uh, being able to plan ahead. You may have the commodities and supplies to build the structure, you don't have the land. You also have to think about other things that um, I was reading that uh, uh, you know, the rainy season, there's a rainy season that starts in June. You have to be anticipating that the rain's going to come, and 70% uh, the of, the, of the area that had been inundated and flooded is still um, flooded with seawater and is still being needed, needed to be pumped out. So the ability to get the water out before the rainy season comes is a, is a big challenge. Um, and as you think about you know, moving to permanent situations, not only is it shelter and basic needs, but the livelihoods of the people have to be considered. And in, in, the, um, in those areas, agriculture and fishing are very, very important parts of the economy and the livelihoods. So a lot of the rice paddies that are low uh, were inundated with seawater. 
Um, and I read that in the Iwate uh, prefect that 96% of the boats were damaged, the fishing boats. So you talk about an impact on the livelihoods, the ability to restore your income and be able to, to have a livelihood again is something you need to be thinking about and planning for ahead of time. And the supply chain plays a key role in that. Now, early on in, in, in this phase of going emergency to transition in Haiti, uh, several students got involved with an effort that was led by the US government in trying to understand what are the needs in that situation. And, um, and what you're trying to do in terms of, in terms of estimating demand is, and understand what should we trigger in terms of the supply chain, you know, in, in typical supply chains, we'll think about using historical data uh, to you know, look at past, you know, for, for um, Walmart, they'll look at past sales to say what we think we're gonna sell next year to Yossi's daughter. Um, well, maybe she doesn't, she isn't as easy to predict, but some people are more predictable in their shopping. So we use historical data. We may incorporate some other causal models, causal forecasting models, other, other factors to help adjust some of that historical data. Um, in, a, in a disaster situation, these kind of models are not as, as useful. While you can estimate to some extent if there's an earthquake in, a, um, in Japan or if there's a hurricane in the Caribbean, we, it's like similar hurricanes we've seen before, um, everyone is going to be slightly different and so you can't project it the same way. But, um, but at this initial stage, what the, the organizations will do will start pushing supplies out in kind of a, a template response, anticipating what they think will be the situation. But quickly they want to transition to getting some real-time data on the ground to characterize what's going on. Now we don't have any point of sale to record say, you know, the demand and, and nobody's placing orders, so you have to go out and assess what is the demand, what are the needs of the people. And this is very difficult to do. But you want to do this quickly because you don't want to be pushing supplies in a constrained environment that are not needed. You want to understand what are the real needs on the ground and also incorporating expertise into this picture. So um, like I mentioned, some, some students at MIT got involved in this in Haiti in the February, March timeframe. So not in the immediate aftermath, but soon after, trying to understand what are the needs uh, um, in the displacement camps in Port-au-Prince. And by going out and doing a survey using a, a PDA and asking questions of people, we were able to track in, in 41 of the um, largest camps in Port-au-Prince, we visited them um, every, uh, there's four periods, we, we visited them and trying to get trends of what happened in terms of shelter. And this is the, the statistic of percentage of people who had access to a waterproof roof. So again, I mentioned shelter was an important thing uh, leading into the rainy season in, in Port-au-Prince. So you can see that there was high need even a, a month, uh, two months into the, into the response, still a, a, a decent gap of people that were not receiving, not having access to shelter. But by um, the time the rainy season hit and, the, and hurricane season hit, um, oh, over half of the camps had everyone that was surveyed responded that they had a waterproof uh, shelter. So you can start to track and see what, are the, what is the priority. Then, therefore, in June and July, that particular shelter need is no longer as important, and you start moving into transitional shelters, which is exactly what happened. The, the, the focus on transitional shelters and finding the land to set up transitional shelters um, happened. So using this kind of data, you can start to understand what the needs are as they shift throughout the, the crisis. In terms of supply, so uh, we're trying to monitor demand, but then we're also trying to think about what are the different supply channels we can use. Uh, obviously, if you can preposition things in what we call speculative capacity in supply chain management, then you can respond quickly. So the UN has a set of depots around the world um, that are ready to respond to disasters in various regions. The Red Cross has set up depots in very much the similar places. Um, they can leverage each other's assets that way in terms of responding. Governments can also do this, and the governments tend to call this stockpiles. Uh, for example, in the state of Florida, this is a warehouse in the state of Florida, they have 300 truckloads of bottled water sitting there and 54 truckloads of meals sitting waiting for the next hurricane, tornado, whatever um, disaster comes across the panhandle of Florida, which is with frequency. But um, one of the keys is, you know, it's hard to justify this to, stack, to taxpayers, they're able to finance this by setting up what they call vendor managed inventory situation with their suppliers to, to so that the, the capital to invest in, in buying this water is not um, on the taxpayer. It's only purchased once it's used. So, and if you want to find out more why, the, why a vendor would do that with the state of Florida, I can tell you more afterwards. But, um, so sometimes you can set up stockpiles without having a lot of cash outlay, which could be effective. But in general, it's expensive to put up stockpiles and, and to preposition inventory 
and you are still, again, guessing as to what the, what the disasters are going to be. And it's even expensive. You know, Panama, when the earthquake hit in Haiti, then another one hit in, in Chile, they had already dumped all their supplies into, into, um, into Haiti. And therefore, if Chile, I mean, it didn't need as much as, as maybe uh, could have been the situation, but it would have been very expensive to shift, ship it from other hubs. So even if you have it prepositioned, you may not have enough to, to respond to, to uh, you know, events that happen in, in succession in a region. So if you don't have it prepositioned, you have to mobilize it. And this, that's the word they use in the humanitarian sector. This is our reactive capacity. And you'll use either international suppliers, or you'd like to use local suppliers. First of all, they're nearer. The, the, the response time is quicker. Plus, it feeds the local economy and helps the recovery. One of the challenges with local suppliers is there are certain standards you want to have and uphold in providing aid to people. And sometimes it's hard to validate that the local suppliers will comply with whatever uh, guidelines you've set, a, set aside, for example, in, for example, in the Red Cross catalogs. On the other side, the international supply chain a lot of times are dealing with donations from governments. So they have a nice process here of, of requisitions, um, getting bids, competitive bid analysis, evaluating the bids, then making a purchase order, and finally getting it into the process. So it can be a long process to engage an international supply. And when you're trying to do it in a matter of days, this, you can't afford this kind of process. So you have to have set up different kinds of contracts and ways of working with suppliers and build that capacity, that ability to respond, and the, and the processes to respond quickly ahead of time so that you don't have to go through the bureaucratic process when a disaster hits. So it's a lot of time spent on how, determining which products you want to try to set up agreements with so that this process is quicker. And for some things, you don't, it's obviously expensive to do that for everything you might order, but you have to prioritize which ones you're going to try to, to focus on. Then the third basic source of supply in a disaster is in-kind donations. People not only you know, the, want, you know, will give money, but a lot of times they want to give something tangible. Uh, you want to feel like you're giving something of, that you can touch and feel that will go to somebody in need. Um, and while we try to tell people that this often clogs the supply chain, um, you know, I've heard lots of stories of planes that arrived in, in Port-au-Prince with winter clothes or with, uh, you know, expensive medical equipment that will be valuable at some point for Haiti but was not very important in the immediate response uh, to the earthquake. Um, these things can, can clog up the supply chain and, and prevent the flow of more important items reaching people. So we try as, an, as a community to encourage people to give money. But if you want to have that connection, and you want to also allow people to make that connection, I have an example from my, my background is a Mennonite background, and there's a group called Mennonite Central Committee. And I remember this as a kid. I didn't realize the importance of this for the supply chain. But they would always tell us, go shopping at the store. They'd, tell, they'd give us a shopping list. They said, you had to buy new items. You cannot take stuff off your shelf. It's not a way of emptying out your closet. You buy new items. Bring them there. They'll be packed by people who know how to pack the, the, the buckets the right way. They'll be loaded on a truck in a certain way so that it's already prepackaged, efficiently packed, ready to go out so that when it arrives, it can be taken and distributed in the most effective way. I didn't realize that I was participating in a supply chain at the time, but that, that ability to take items and make kits that are useful um, upon delivery really helped the supply chain flow faster. Now, it, on top of that, people might still want to do something that they've made themselves. Mennonites are known for making blankets and quilts, and so there is that ability. If you want to make a blanket, you can send one in, but it's not the primary thing that they're trying to get donations for. And if you make really good quil uh, quilts, they'll tell you don't send it in. Instead, we'll sell it and get the money for it and use that for the response. Um, there are also organizations that um, enabling companies to, to provide better donations uh, and match that up. One of those is Aid Matrix. It's a technology uh, uh, solution to help companies be able to say, I have some surplus inventory. Is there a, a need on the other side? It's a marketplace to match those opportunities. So the, the ability to manage in-kind donations is getting better, although that can be a thing that will clog up a supply chain. And then finally, um, the actors involved, and we hear a lot about coordination in a disaster. Coordination is a challenge. Uh, and depending on where it happens, you'll have different um, groups that are involved from the local population. That's where most of the response actually happens, people providing for each other and their communities. Uh, the national and local governments ideally will take the lead. Foreign governments will help where they need to, along with the multilateral agencies and international NGOs. The private sector. You know, in the U.S., that's been um, a, a very strong engagement with the private sector since Katrina to try to see how they can play a more active role. And the military is starting to play a, a more active role in some response activities as well. So there is, and we're getting actually more actors involved in this response. So 
And each of those has their own decentralized organization and jurisdictions and so forth that Yossi mentions can be a challenge. So it becomes a big issue to coordinate. You know, in Haiti, there were over 1,000 NGOs operating. So to get everybody on the same page is a challenge. There is a system for this. Uh, it's called the cluster system. Don't know, ask me why, where the name came from. But it's set up by the Interagency Standing Committee, which is primarily led by UN organizations, but some other large NGOs like Red Cross. And they've organized things by these clusters. WASH is water and sanitation, nutrition, health. So if you want to know what's going on in a disaster that, where the international community is active, like in Haiti, they set up websites and portals, and they provide situation reports to tell you what's going on. It's the best source of information. It's not a perfect coordination yet but it's better than it has been in the past, and I think that there's a definite in, uh, initiative to improve this. And they like working with people at universities like MIT to help them, especially in information management, managing the information that's coming in from all the different sources that could help us give an idea of what the demand is, and also all the different providers of supply to try to coordinate things. So this is, a, 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 in an international response, this is the group that will be in charge. In a, in a situation like Katrina or in, the, in Japan right now, where you have a strong government to take the lead, um, they will do that. And the international community is not, this, this cluster system is not going to be set up typically. And in fact, in, in Japan, just as an example, right after this is the earthquake happened, and soon after they had already established the headquarters, had their first meetings, and they've been meeting ever since um, to coordinate things uh, from the government perspective. And involving, obviously, not just the central government, but also the, the prefectures and the local governments and the municipalities as well. Um, then, there is some international involvement, and they will call in international help for certain things like search and rescue, actually for making assessments. There's a certain uh, capability in making assessments of needs quickly um, that they've been able to use. But at this point now, it's transitioning to the, 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 this group called the Japan Platform is coordinating all the international NGO uh, efforts. Primarily at this point, and I read that the, the UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs this week is officially stop, is not going to track this emergency anymore because the government has said that we don't need you to be actively involved. We'll call you in as needed for certain things. For example, they needed some warehouse capacity at the Sendai airport. So World Food Program is really good at putting up temporary warehouses. So they, they set up 20 warehouses in the Sendai airport. But in general, it's not, supplies are not needing to flow in from these UN organizations and NGOs at this point. The government is taking the lead. So, it depends on the context whether the cluster system of the NGOs and the UN will get involved or whether the government will be taking the lead uh, in the situation for coordinating. So. so that's a little bit of the demand and supply for humanitarian context and who's involved and a little bit more about where you can find information if you're wanting to track what's going on. These situation reports usually have a lot of info information about what's happening if you want to tra track more than what you see in the news. So, thanks. Oh, I didn't mention. I should mention one other thing. I forgot. Um, we did have a course this spring. Um, I decided I had a bunch of data from Haiti, and I wanted to analyze it, so I thought I'd, I'd put a class together and get students to help me analyze the data. Uh, 43 students responded. I was really overwhelmed with that response. And it involved, the nice thing was it involved a very broad range of disciplines. We had um, 10 different schools represented across MIT, T Harvard, and Tufts. Different backgrounds all coming together to try to look at the data um, and the information that comes in a, in a response and how we can make that supply flow more effectively to, to, to beneficiaries. I think there's a real power in, the, the, first of all, the energy of students to address these issues and the diversity of backgrounds and experience. And hopefully we continue to build on this through our work here at MIT. We're going to offer this course again next year and provide more of these opportunities for students to get involved. So. Um, when you stay up, let's say if there are some questions, uh, we'll be able. You look like Roberto. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question about this Japan platform serving as a consolidation entity, like a, like a middle person kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about issues of trust, accountability, and funding. Uh, in the rush of the moment, when there's the emergency and the images in the TV, people feel generous, they want to donate. But we've heard stories not from Japan yet, but from Haiti, of people doubting whether the donation was used correctly and so on, and they're accountable for this. So I'm wondering, this uh, platform that says, okay, I'm going to be the, the middle person, or uh, the government saying, help me with this, uh, United Nations, what kind of um, accountability is there after the fact so that we can protect the 
goodwill of the donors for the next event? So I would say that the, the Japan platform, it's, it's about accountability. The coordinators are not usually the ones that are going to be providing the accountability. They're coordinating across the organizations. The accountability comes from within the organization. So donations are usually made to a particular organization, like a Red Cross, like a World Food Program, and they have a very formal process to do monitoring and evaluation of what they're doing and reporting back exactly how uh, donations are used. In fact, sometimes this can go so far as to prevent some good things in a supply chain, such as, you know, if the donation for a particular medicine um, is from the UK and another one is from the US, we have to track it so carefully to know where it goes that if we run out of the US when we can't just borrow from the UK temporarily to, feed, to, to provide for a need. So sometimes that accountability can go too far. It's always a balance you're trying to provide. So, but there, the accountability comes through the organizations, not through the coordinating agency. Yeah. Any other questions? Not everybody at once, please. Okay, if not, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming. Thanks.